Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India friends in this 18th session to the course of administrative law i have come with the topic the ombudsman this topic of ombudsman or the term ombudsman itself may be new for you and therefore it is to be understood with reference to the functioning of the government the ombudsman is considered to be the boss dog over the administration or the institution which keeps the eye on administration why it is needed that there should be a boss dog or there should be the consistent eye over the administration or over the functioning of administration we all know on the basis of our earlier discussion on various topics of administrative law that the administration in the modern complex form of government in the regime of welfare state is performing many fold functions and particularly the administrative branch or the administration it does not perform only the administrative functions but in addition to the administrative functions the administration also perform the the legislative functions and even the adjudicatory functions it means that why the functioning of the government the rights liberties and freedoms of the people are affected on the other hand because of this tremendous increase in the functions and powers of the government the functions and powers of the administration the administration may misuse or abuse these powers in the words of lord acton that power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely and therefore they may all there may always be the chances the opportunities for the administration to be corrupt because of the increased functions because of the increased powers because of the increased discretion of the administration itself and therefore there is always the need of an effective mechanism to control the administration or to to keep an eye over the administration whether the administration is functioning within the limits of powers whether there is no arbitrary exercise of power by the administration and this particular need it relates to the requirement of ombudsman as i told you thus due to the remarkable and wonderful increase in the powers and functions of the government and administration the government functionaries and the administrative authorities nowadays exercise wide discretionary powers this state of situation has led to the increased possibility of misuse of powers by the governmental functionaries and administrative authorities in exercising their powers and performing their functions therefore it becomes important to have a proper check and control on the actions of the governmental functionaries and administrative authorities for holding them responsible and responsible to the people friends any good government any good administration requires to be accountable and receptive system to the people an advanced innovative forward looking and effective system of government and administration always needs an independent impartial and effective mechanism for addressing the grievances against administrative defaults though the parliamentary form of government 
is considered to be a responsible government because the rulers in such kind of government always rule on difference of people. Yet it is also the proved fact that partition attitude in dealing with the grievances of the people and attitude of governmental functionaries to defend the functions and performance of the government have become the realities. We all know that in the parliamentary form of the government itself, where the parliamentarians, whether the politicians, they always supervise the administration. And therefore, we see the partition, we see the partiality in the decision making process by the administration. And it justifies the fact that there should be continuous control, consistent control on the administrative functions. There must be an effective mechanism to have the proper control over the administrative functionary. And these all the realities and the attitude of the government functionaries are responsible for creating the atmosphere of non-confidence and dissatisfaction among the people particularly who make the complaint against the administration. We all know that nowadays the most part of the litigation relates to the disputes between the administration and the individual. And when any complaints are made against the actions of the administration at first hand, these complaints go to the administration itself. And if these complaints are not resolved with an impartial attitude, with an independent status, if in resolving these complaints of the citizens or the people or the individuals against the administration itself are dealt with by the administration with partiality or if the political influences work in the mechanism of resolution of dispute by the administration, then certainly the confidence of the people would be frustrated. We know the democracy, the whole structure of the democracy, the whole structure of parliamentary form of the government, it is built up, it is built on the confidence of the people in the governmental functioning. And if the confidence of the people is lost, then that country or that nation cannot survive, cannot develop. And therefore, the participation of the people in the development of the country, it is required that there must be independent and impartial mechanism to resolve the dispute or to redress or to deal with the grievances of the people so that the people may also have the proper remedies against the administration itself. This is also the logic or this is also the justification behind the need of some regulatory bodies. Because a regulatory body or a regulatory agency refers to a public authority or a governmental agency which exercises autonomous regulatory or supervisory authority over a specific area of governmental or administrative activities. In our country and elsewhere also, the adoption of the institution of ombudsman and the creation and establishment of other regulatory bodies has been made for the same purpose of having an independent, impartial and effective mechanism to redress the grievances of the people against the administration. Friends, the institution of ombudsman is considered to be the provider of independent redress and the grievances and complaints against administration, administrative officials and governmental functionaries. The basic role of ombudsman is to handle complaints about maladministration, poor services, facilities and amenities or unfair treatment by the governmental functionaries or service providers. This shows the role of the ombudsman. The basic role of ombudsman is to handle the complaints about the maladministration, about the poor services on the part of the administration, about the facilities being given by the administration and the amenities, amenities which are being provided on the part of the administration. The ombudsman also has the role with regard to unfair treatment by governmental functionaries 
or service providers. The ombudsman generally refers to an independent and autonomous institution. This is very important that the ombudsman refers to an independent and autonomous institution or body created or appointed by the government to safeguard the interest of the general public in matters of maladministration and violation of rights of the citizens by investigating into the complaints being filed by the citizens. The independence, the impartiality and the autonomous status of ombudsman, it is very crucial in resolving the disputes or in inquiring into the complaints of the grievances of the citizens against the administration itself. If such a mechanism of or such an institution does not have the autonomous status or it is influenced by the government or the administration itself, if it does not have the independence, it does not have the impartiality, then certainly the probabilities or the apprehensions which the people have in their mind with regard to the administrative adjudicatory authorities will always be there with the ombudsman also. And therefore, for the redressal of the grievances of the people or the citizens against the administration in impartial manner, it is the condition precedent that such an institution or the ombudsman should be independent, it should be autonomous in its status. Ombudsman is a Scandinavian word which means a delegate, an agent, an officer or the commissioner. It is not easy to precisely define the term ombudsman, but we can take an idea about the meaning of the term ombudsman from the definition given by Garner. Garner defines ombudsman, see that the ombudsman is an officer of parliament having as his primary function the duty of acting as an agent of parliament for the purpose of safeguarding citizens against abuse or misuse of the administrative power by the executive. What does it mean? That to understand the, the, the meaning of the term ombudsman, the ombudsman is an authority which is appointed by the government for what? To investigate into the complaints against the governmental functionaries and administrative authorities. It is also true that the concept of ombudsman was first originated in Scandinavian and Nordic countries and then it became popular in Europe and other parts of globe. The institution of ombudsman came into existence in Sweden in 1809. This is very old origin. It shows very old origin of the institution of ombudsman when it was adopted by the Sweden in 1809 and in Finland it was adopted in 1919. The Denmark, Denmark introduced the system of ombudsman in 1955. Norway and New Zealand adopted the institution of ombudsman in 1960. So, you can see during or in between 1809 when Sweden adopted the institution of ombudsman and till 1962 Finland, Denmark, Norway, New Zealand, many countries they adopted the institution of ombudsman. In England, the institution of ombudsman was also adopted in 1966. Behind the adoption of the institution of ombudsman in England, there is a history. I have already told you under the topic of the rule of law, the development of rule of law in England, 
about delegated legislation also about the constitutionality of delegated legislation about the development of rule of law at all the events of discussions be referred to the history of england you must be aware of the fact which we have already discussed that in 1929 during 1929 1930 the, the donogmore committee the committee on ministers powers was appointed and it investigated into the area of the administrative rule making or the administrative legislative functions of the administration then one act was enacted in the name of statutory instrument act and delegated legislation or the area of administrative legislation or the legislative powers of the administration were started to be regulated by this enactment then after the crushel down affair franks committee was appointed and on the recommendations of franks committee the area of administrative adjudication started to be regulated by the tribunals and inquiries act which was enacted in the follow up of the recommendations of the franks committee in 1958 up to the 1958 the two major areas of the new activities of the administration the delegated legislation and the administrative adjudication it started to be regulated by two different enactments but there was no comprehensive inquiry into the area of administrative functioning of the government or the administrative functions of the administration itself purely administrative functions then the justice the english wing of international commission of jurist justice the english wing of international commission of jurist it inquired investigated into the area of administrative functioning and one report was prepared by justice an english wing of international commission of jurist that report is known as wert report in 1961 justice submitted this report prepared this report after making an inquiry into the area of administrative functioning in this report and wait report the justice recommended the adoption of an institution like ombudsman and in 1966 the great britain the england adopted the institution of ombudsman by appointing parliamentary commissioner the name of ombudsman or the nomenclature of ombudsman in england was parliamentary commissioner to keep an eye on administration and became the first large nation in the democratic world to have such a system so britain became the first large democracy to adopt the system or the institution of ombudsman in 1966 in australia it has been adopted both at the center as well as the state level the western australia was the first to establish the institution of ombudsman in australia by enacting the parliamentary commissioners act 1971 so in australia in 1971 it was adopted in 1966 goana adopted the institution of ombudsman and became the first developing country important to note that the guana becomes the first developing country to adopt the institution of ombudsman in 1966 the ombudsman adopted by guana in 1966 was also to keep an eye on administration then after this it was adopted by mauritius singapore and malaysia then in india also there was a search for any such effective mechanism or institution which could have the consistent eye over the administrative functioning or which could act as the watch dog over the administrative functioning or which could be 
sufficiently capable of redressing the grievances or the complaints of the citizens against the administrative functionaries, against the administrative officials. And this search started from 1960s. During 1960s, then law minister Ashok Kumar Sen first time advocated the need of the concept of constitutional ombudsman in India. During the discussion on the floor of the parliament, it was first ever proposal for the adoption of the system of ombudsman in our country. In 1960s, the, the, the time of 1960s, the phase of 1960s was the time when first proposal for the adoption of ombudsman came in India by then law minister. In 1966, the first administrative reform commission also recommended the setting up of an independent authority, authorities at both the central and the state level to look into the complaints against public functionaries including members of parliament and the members of the state legislature. It is very important to note that in 1966, the first administrative reforms committee, the committee which was constituted to investigate into the area of administrative functioning and to suggest the effective measures and to suggest the safeguards against the administrative excesses and to suggest for the proper functioning of the administration. This administrative reforms committee in 19 commission in 1966 in its recommendations recommended for the adoption of the institution of ombudsman the institution like or the body like or authority like ombudsman at both the levels the state level and the union level and that was also the important the significant feature of the recommendations of the administrative reform commission that the administrative reform commission was of the opinion that there must be an independent authority at both the central and state level to look into the complaints against public functionaries including members of parliament and the members of state legislatures. That was the recommendation of administrative reforms committee that the members of parliament and the members of state legislatures should also be included within the scope of the jurisdiction of such an independent authority which is to look into the complaints, which is to investigate into the complaints of the citizens against the administrative functionaries. In 1968, the first Lokpal will was introduced in Lok Sabha. When the government of India accepted the recommendations of the commission. The government accepted the recommendations of the first administrative reforms commission and then the government prepared a bill in the name of Lokpal Bill 1968. This Lokpal Bill 1968 was introduced in Lok Sabha. It was passed by the Lok Sabha in 1969. But in January 1970, the Lok Sabha was dissolved and it could not be passed by the Rajya Sabha and consequently this bill which was first time introduced in Indian parliament in the name of Lokpal bill was lapsed. The terminology or the phraseology or the term Lokpal and Lokayukt, these were coined by Dr. L. M. Singhvi who was an Indian jurist parliamentarian, a scholar, author and diplomat. He coined the word Lokpal and Lokayukt. After this first initiative to adopt or for adopting the institution of Ombudsman in India in the name of Lokpal and Lokayukt, several efforts were made to pass the Lokpal bill by parliament in 1971. The Lokpal bill was introduced in Lok Sabha, followed by 1977, then 1985, then 1989, 
then 1996, then 1998. After 1998, again in 2001, the Lokpal bill was introduced in Lok Sabha. But because of one or the other reason, all these bills intended to adopt the institution of Ombudsman in India could not be materialized or could not be transformed into an act. These bills could not be passed by both the houses of parliament for one or the other reason. Then in pursuance to the efforts to establish an effective mechanism to deal with the complaints against public officials including high functionaries, the government constituted a joint drafting committee to draft new law Lok Palwell in 2011. That was the time. Just remember the incidences of 2011-2012 from 2009 to 2011-12. All over the country, the movements, the agitations against the corruption emerged out. And one very popular movement against the corruption was led by the social worker, social reformer Anna Hajareji. Because of this social, the pressure created by the social movements against the corruption all over the country, the draft committee was appointed by the government to draft the Lokpal bill. The Lokpal bill was drafted and it was introduced in Lok Sabha. The bill was referred to the Parliamentary Standing Committee. The Parliamentary Standing Committee studied the bill, made its comments over the bill and then the report was submitted by the Parliamentary Standing Committee. Because of the recommendations of the Parliamentary Standing Committee, the government decided to withdraw the Lokpal Bill 2011 because of the weaknesses of this bill. Because of the non-acceptance of this bill by the civil society or why the persons who were leading different social movements against the corruption. One important institution or the organization in this regard was India against corruption and under the banner of India against corruption, such movements were very huge movements were made in India. Then the government withdrew this bill in 2011 and decided to reintroduce the bill in new form with new content. Then on 4th August 2011, the Lokpal Bill 2011 which was introduced in Lok Sabha and referred to the parliamentary committee was withdrawn by the government. The next initiative was taken by the government to adopt the institution of Ombudsman on 22nd December 2011, when the Lokpal and Lokayukt Bill 2011 was introduced. And this Lokpal and Lokayukt Bill 2011 was enacted in the form of Lokpal and Lokayukt Act 2013. The Lokpal and Lokayukt Act 2013 establishment it is for the establishment of Lokpal at the union and the Lokayuktas at state. So the Lokpal and Lokayukt Act 2013 was intended to establish the Lokpal at union level and the Lokayuktas at state level. Both the Lokpal and Lokayuktas, these are statutory bodies and does not have any constitutional status. It is the point to be highlighted that the Lokpal and Lokayuktas bill 2000 
11 which was introduced and which was converted or transformed or which was enacted in the form of the Lokpal and Lokayukta Act 2013. That was an a statutory institution both the Lokayukta and Lokpal both were the statutory institutions, statutory bodies and they did not have any constitutional status. They performed the function of an ombudsman to inquire into allegations of corruption against certain public functionaries and for related matters. We all know that the mal administration is considered to be a termite which weakens the very foundation of any nation and which affects the administration adversely. The corruption in any country, we can take the example of various countries where the corruption prevailed, it thrilled the, it damaged the, ruined the, destroyed the founding pillars of the economies of those nations, countries like termite and therefore the mal administration is considered to be a termite which always beacons, which always destroys the founding pillars of any nation because it affects the administration adversely, it affects the administration badly. Corruption seems to be fundamental cause of this problem. When the corruption seems to be the fundamental cause of this problem and therefore, always when we take any initiative to reform the administration, that should certainly hit the root cause of the maladministration. And the root cause of the foundational cause of the maladministration seems to be the corruption. And therefore, the Indian institution of Ombudsman, which was established in 2013, it intended to hit the corruption prevailing in the administrative functioning. Most of the anti-corruption agencies, these are hardly independent. We have seen many times even the Supreme Court of India, the various high courts have made the comments even for the Central Bureau of Investigation, CBI or other investigative agencies because these do not seem to be independent and impartial for several political reasons, for several personal reasons, always the allegations are made that these agencies are utilized by the government. That is also one important challenge in the path of the adoption of any such mechanism or the institution to deal with the maladministration, to deal with the grievances, to deal with the complaints of the citizens or the people against the administration. Many of these bodies also seem to be advisory bodies without an effective power and their advice is rarely followed. Such bodies are always recommendatory bodies and the government is to take the action. It is not mandatory for the government to take the action on the recommendations of these investigative bodies. This is also one important weakness of these investigative bodies. There is also the problem of internal transparency and accountability. Without internal transparency and without the accountability, the administration cannot be run on sound footings. There would always be the problem of my administration if transparency is not there, if the accountability is not there. There is not any separate and effective mechanism to put checks on these agencies. And in this context, it was realized that an independent institution of Lokpal may be the landmark move in the history of the Indian polity, which offered a solution to the newer ending menace of corruption and 
for this purpose the 2013 lokpal and lokayukt act was enacted if we see some key provisions or significant provisions of the lokpal and lokayukt act 2013 we can understand that what is the composition or the constitution of lokpal and lokayuktas What is the status, legal status of Lokpal in India? Whether the Lokpal in India seems to be autonomous and independent body or not? What are the powers of Lokpal? Whether the Lokpal is just like other investigative or investigatory agencies which do not have the real powers, which are only the recommendatory bodies? Or in contrast, the Lokpal has some such powers by which it can have the proper control over the mad administration and the practices of corruption in Indian polity. If we see section 3 of the Lokpal and Lokayukta Act 2013, section 3, subsection 1, there shall be established for the purpose of this act a body to be called the Lokpal. Section 3 relates to the establishment of the Lokpal. The Lokpal shall consist of number 1, a chairperson who is or has been a chief justice of India or is or has been a judge of the Supreme Court or an eminent person who fulfills the eligibility specified in clause B of subsection 3. Such members of members, such number of members, it shall consist of such number of members not exceeding 8 out of whom 50 percent shall be judicial members. There shall be 8 members, maximum 8 members and out of these maximum 8 members, 50 percent must be the judicial members provided that not less than 50 percent of the members of the Lokpal shall be from amongst the persons belonging to scheduled caste, scheduled tribes and other backward classes, minorities and women. So, twofold restrictions are made on the composition of Lokpal. There must be number maximum 8 and out of the total number of the members of Lokpal, 50 percent must be the judicial members. And then the further restriction is the twofold restriction as to the qualifications of the members that 50 percent must be from amongst the different areas like scheduled tribes, scheduled caste, other backward classes, women and minorities. Now, subsection 3 provides for the eligibility criteria for a person to be appointed as Lokpal. A person shall be eligible to be appointed, number one, as a judicial member if he is or has been a judge of the Supreme Court or is or has been a chief justice of high court. Judicial for any person to be the judicial member of the Lokpal shall have, should have been the judge of the Supreme Court or he should have been the, he should has been the chief justice of any high court. So, only two kinds of persons could be appointed as the judicial member. Number one, the person who has been the judge of the Supreme Court or the person who has been the chief justice of any high court. Then, as a member of other than judicial members, if he is a person of integrity and outstanding ability, having a special knowledge and expertise of not less than 25 years in the matters relating to anti-corruption policy, public administration, vigilance, finance, including insurance and banking, law and management. These are the areas. He should have been the person having the experience of not less than 25 years in these areas. Then subsection 4 of section 3 provides that the chairperson or the member shall not be a member of parliament or the member of the legislature of any state or union territory. 
these are the disqualifications for a person to be the member of Lokpal. He shall not be the member of parliament or the member of any state legislature. He shall not be a person convicted of any offence involving moral turpitude. He shall not be a person of less than 45 years of age on the date of assuming office as the chairperson or member as the case may be. He shall not be a member of any panchayat or municipality. He shall not be a person who has been removed or dismissed from the service of the union or state. He shall not hold any office of trust or profit or be affiliated with any political party or carry on any business or practice any profession accordingly before the he enters upon his office a person appointed as the chairperson or the member as the case may be. So, the disqualifications are given in subsection 4 of section 5. In clause A of subsection 4, it is provided that if he holds any office of trust or profit, resign from such office. And if he is carrying on any business or his connection with the conduct and management of such business, then he cannot be the person. He cannot be appointed as the member of Lokpal. Section 4 provides for the procedure of the appointment. How to appoint the members of Lokpal? The chairperson and members shall be appointed by the president after obtaining the recommendations of selection committee consisting of. So, there shall be a selection committee and on the recommendation of the selection committee, the president will appoint the chairperson of Lokpal and the members of Lokpal. That committee will consist of the prime minister as the chairperson the Speaker of the House of the People as the member, the Leader of Opposition in the House of the People as the member. So, this committee of three persons, Prime Minister, Chairperson, the Leader of Opposition in the House of the People as the member, then one eminent jurist as recommended by the Chairperson and members referred to in clause A to D above to be nominated by the President as member. There would be four persons, four members in the committee. Prime Minister would be chairman of this committee, selection committee for Lokpal, chairperson and members of Lokpal. Number two, the speaker of Lok Sabha will be the member. The leader of opposition in Lok Sabha will be the member. And then one eminent jurist will be the member of this committee. And the name of this eminent jurist will be recommended collectively by the chairperson and the members, meaning thereby the whole committee of three persons, the prime minister, the speaker of Lok Sabha and then the leader of opposition in Lok Sabha collectively decide that who will be the fourth member of the committee, selection committee for appointing a person as the member of Lokpal or the chairperson of Lokpal. And on the recommendation of this committee, the appointment shall be made by the President of India. Subsection 2 of section 4 provides that no appointment of the chairperson or the member shall be invalid merely by reason of any vacancy in the selection committee. So, if the selection committee has any vacancy, so only on the basis of this ground that selection committee has the vacancy, the appointment of any person as the member of Lokpal or the chairperson of Lok Lokpal shall not be valid. Subsection 3 of section 4 provides that the selection committee shall for the purposes of selecting the chairperson and members of the Lokpal and for preparing a panel of persons to be considered for appointment as such constitute a search committee consisting of at least seven persons of standing and having special knowledge and expertise in the matters relating to anti-corruption, policy, public administration, vigilance, policy making, finance including insurance and banking, law and management, 
or in any other matter which in the opinion of the selection committee may be useful in making the selection of the chairperson and members of lokpal so panel will be prepared by the committee provided that not less than 50% of the members of the search committee shall be from amongst the persons belonging to the scheduled caste the scheduled tribes other backward classes minorities and women so for search committee itself the restrictions have been imposed there would be the four members and among these four members 50% members shall be among the persons belonging to scheduled caste scheduled tribes other backward classes minorities and women provided further that the selection committee may also consider any person other than the persons recommended by the search committee the selection committee shall regulate its own procedure in a transparent manner for selecting the chairperson and members of the lokpal and the term of such committee referred to in sub clause sub section 3 the fees and allowances payable to its members and the manner of selection of panel of names shall be such as may be prescribed so the the selection committee will consider only the names of the panel which are finalized by the search committee c section 5 the president shall take or cause to be taken all necessary steps for the appointment of new chairperson and members at least 3 months before the expiry of the term of the chairperson or the member in accordance with the procedure laid down in this act section 6 provides that the chairperson and member shall on the recommendation of the selection committee be appointed by the president by warrant under his hand and seal and hold office as such for the term of 5 years from the date on which he enters upon his office or until he attains the age of 70 years whichever is earlier maximum tenure of office is 5 years or till the person attains the age of 70 years which is earlier provided that he may be he may by writing under his hand address to the president may resign from his office and may be or he may be removed from the office in manner provided in section 37 section 7 talks about the salary allowances and other conditions of service of chairperson and the members section 11 is also important subsection 1 of section 11 says not withstanding anything contained in any law for the time being in force the lokpal shall constitute an inquiry wing headed by the director of inquiry for the purpose of conducting preliminary inquiry into an offence alleged to have been committed by a public servant punishable under the prevention of corruption act 1988 provided that till such time the inquiry being is constituted by the lokpal the central government shall make available such number of officers and other staff from its ministries or departments as may be required by the lokpal so a uh, there is the provision of making or constituting the inquiry being by the lokpal then section 12 talks about the prosecution being 11 and 12 both are important because 11 talks about the inquiry being and then 12 talks about the prosecution being section 14 of the act gives the jurisdiction of lokpal it is very important aspect of the institution of lokpal because always there has been the debate on the scope of the jurisdiction of the lokpal under section 14 of lokpal and lokayukt act 2013 jurisdiction has been conferred and according to section 14 the jurisdiction of lokpal includes prime minister ministers members of parliament group a b c and d officers and officials of central government so very wide jurisdiction has been given the prime minister and ministers similarly in the under the jurisdiction of lokayukt the chief minister the ministers of that state members of the council of ministers of that state and the similar officials of that state are included within the jurisdiction of lokayukt 
सेक्शन ट्वेंटी प्रोवाइड्स फॉर द प्रोविजन रिलेटिंग टू द कंप्लेन एंड प्रिलिमरी इंक्वायरी एंड इन्वेस्टिगेशन हाउ द कंप्लेन आर टू बी फाइल्ड हाउ द प्रिलिमरी इंक्वायरीज एंड इन्वेस्टिगेशन आर टू बी मेड द प्रोसीजर एंड द मैनर ऑफ मेकिंग सच इंक्वायरीज एंड इन्वेस्टिगेशन इज प्रोवाइडेड अंडर सेक्शन ट्वेंटी अंडर सेक्शन ट्वेंटी टू द लोकपाल में रिक्वायर any public servant or any other person to furnish information this is also very significant provision or the feature of the act that the lokpal may require any public servant or any other person to furnish information without receiving the informations relating to the mal administration relating to the corruption the lokpal and lokayuk will also not be in position to redress the complaints or grievances of the people and therefore section 20 becomes relevant in this regard which gives the power to the lokpal to require any public servant or any other person also to furnish the information section 23 talks about the power of lokpal to grant sanction for initiating prosecution it is also the sanctioning authority section 25 makes the lokpal a supervisory authority supervisory it talks about the supervisory powers of lokpal the lokpal has the power of civil court under section 27 so section 28 gives the power to lokpal to utilize services of officers of central or state government section 32 confers the power on lokpal to recommend transfer or the suspension even a public servant connected with allegation of corruption so pending the inquiry pending the investigation investigation the public servant may be suspended on the recommendation of the lokpal lokpal can make the recommendation for the suspension of such public servant section 34 gives the power to lokpal to give directions to prevent destruction of records during preliminary inquiry it is also very significant provision section 34 provides for the creation establishment of special courts to be constituted to the, the the creation or establishment of the special courts by the central government to deal with the cases relating to the investigation by the lokpal so these are the provisions the important or significant provisions of the lokpal and lokayukt act 2013 and we can understand that by this act an effective mechanism was adopted by the indian government to control the administrative functioning or to supervise the administrative functioning and to redress the complaints and grievances of the citizens of this country by lokpal and lokayuktas friends this is the 18th lecture in which we discuss the ombudsman the concept of ombudsman and the rest provisions of the act which i could not discuss here at this point of discussion are also important for you to go through these provisions and see that what is the status of lokpal and lokayuktas in india and how far this institution which was established in 2013 could succeed in its objective thank you very much
Hello everybody, now uh, the discussion which I would try to um, make uh, talk to you is about the excitement which I always feel and I am sure you will also reciprocate as I proceed and when you do the course is in the area of multivariate statistical problems and multivariate statistical analysis. So, what we mean by multivariate? So, we know that statistics is a, is a subject where you have, have a lot of data, you try to analyze that using different type of techniques like estimation problem, MCMC techniques, then forecasting and the area of time series analysis and then try to basically find out the best forecasting tool which you have such that you are able to gain the maximum amount of information from a set of data. Now, in the recent past as we see that multivariate statistics has, has, has really increased in a, in, in a very exciting manner and if I trace back to history it has been going on slowly for the last about 70, 80 years, but now the time has come where it is being used in a very big way and the techniques which we all know, but which are being utilized with new vigor are in the area of say for example, canonical correlation technique, in the area of factor analysis, in the area of conjoint analysis, in the area of clustering analysis, in the area of multidimensional uh, scaling techniques, structural equation modeling, be it in the area of finance, be it in the area of engineering, be it in the area of social sciences, be it in the area of economics, such that you are able to gather the the information from the data in such a way that it really gives you some useful set of information. Now, in the recent um, past, there has been also an explosion of large and complex data sets, but added to that there has also been a, a commensurate increase in the computing and the statistical techniques. So, obviously, the question comes that if the statistical techniques are there for small, so called small data, not the big data, not the, the, the data which is of terabytes and, and, and so on and so forth, where you use different type of computers to stay the data, the question obviously comes that are those statistical techniques really relevant when we use them in the big data sense. The question is they are not always relevant, they may not give you the best results. So, what we are seeing in years to come and, and I feel very excited about that is that how the new tools which we have already learned in statistics in multivariate statistical analysis are being redrawn, are being say for example, remodeled in such a way that they can be utilized along with the techniques of computing in a very nice manner that we are able to garner the information from big data very successfully and very nicely in such a way that they are able to portray a sense of information which we all long to have from big data, be it in say for example, medical sciences, be in the area of finance, be it in weather forecasting, be it in transportation, so on and so forth. So, obviously, it means that students, participants who are in a position with some brief mathematical background to take multivariate statistics and statistical tools as a subject in this program are assured are a very exciting future where they can use these tools to, to both gain the knowledge as well utilize them in a very best practical sense such that they are able to do some justice to the information which is given to them and get the best information from the data sets. I wish all the participants in this course the best of luck and I am sure they will also reciprocate the excitement which I have for this type of courses. Thank you.